So today we're going to discuss the deep learning models and that's the purpose of this lecture. So in the process we'll talk about the neural network models, some hypotheses cost and optimization based on canonical neural network problem, and the idea calls stochastic gradient descent, and then we'll finally we talk about deep learning and data science. So let's think about what we can use the deep neural networks today. What they can learn today is from types of data like pixels. They can get input of an image, which is a bunch of pixels, and then the output would be the identification of what's in this image. So this requires the neural network to understand the shapes and other kinds of hidden features that makes up a tiger. The other type of data that we can understand using deep neural networks today is the audio. So audio is a waveform and we can understand that the if you're given a waveform can you predict what that audio would be. So for example you can learn from the patterns of the audio to predict what the output is, what's the weather outside. Uh, more exciting is also that if you give a text like hello, how are you, that's your input, and you like to translate it, so you could provide uh, an output in some language like French. So that's exciting. And you can also do interesting things such as combining two objects in a picture, in this case this would be a cat on a hat. So this means that you have to recognize that this picture has a cat and as well as a hat. So we can say it's a cat on a hat. So some of the grand challenges that we can solve with the deep learning are most likely being drug discovery, maybe making solar energy more affordable, and then providing the energy from fusion and also restore and improve urban infrastructure, advance the health informatics, engineer better medicine. In fact, already there are companies who have started to use deep learning to find uh, cures for, medicine, uh, for specific diseases. So obviously securing cyberspace is a big task enhancing the virtual reality and providing access to clean water and also reverse engineer the brain to understand completely the brain. Now, obviously we are a long way away from some of these things, but some of them are being done today. So how do we apply this in healthcare? For example, let's suppose that there are millions of people worldwide with diabetes. So frequent eye exam is important. So what if you can build an app that takes a picture of the eye, retina, and then uh, run it through a neural network and try to identify there's a defect in the eye, it's whether there's no defect, negative, early stage, medium stage, or severe. So this is done by taking a picture and this running this through multiple layers of what we call convolution and sampling and subsampling and convolution and finally providing a, an output which indicates which one of these things it's likely. You still want a physician to look at this for sure, uh, but the early detection systems can help alleviate the lack of access to physicians for many people in all parts of the world. So when it comes to neural network, we talk about the, for example, a four-layer network here, which has an input layer, which we call layer one, and hidden layer one, layer two, and a hidden layer, layer three, and the output layer, layer four. So your input has three components, or three features. Let's just use the notation such as AI is the activation at layer I. For example, A1, is the activation at layer 1 which starts with the input vector x. And then um, the z2 which the uh, if you know the weights of these things so let's call that theta 1 
and then you multiply that by a1, you get c that c to c2, but then you have to, that's a linear function, so you apply a nonlinear transformation to get the actual activation uh, function at the activation at the layer number two, plus the bias at layer number two. And then you go through the same thing. You take the A2, apply a linear transformation. The theta two are the weights here, the, the matrix of weights. You apply that to that, and then apply a non linear transformation into it at the bias at layer three and then continue at the layer four we get the the hypothesis function so the hypothesis function if we train this correctly will have the correct some level of probabilistic outcome at this level so next we are going to present two quizzes and you can click on the quiz button and answer this question. So here's the second question. We are asking the question, what's the total number of parameters needed for this neural network, which is given here? Each of these lines is a parameter. And so you got to compute how many, what the size of matrices that takes the transition from three input to five inputs, for example and do the same thing here. So here's another problem where we are trying to understand how the neural network works. So let's suppose that we have this neural network where we have the 0.5, the weights for A1 is given by, you get, if you're going to compute the A1 as a linear sum, you get one times 0.5, x1 times minus one, where x1 is 1, and x2 times minus 1. So you get a number here, and then once you get the number, you have to apply the activation function. Activation function says if the number is negative, then you use a 0 for that. If the number is positive, you use the number itself. Same you can compute a's of 2 by multiplying 1 times minus 1.5, x1 times 1, x2 times 1, and then apply the uh, activation function g of x into this. This function is called the ReLU function, which is quite useful and quite practical uh, to use in uh, neural network training. So once you get the uh, neurons activated, A1 and A2, they have certain values. And the next thing you're going to do is to compute A3. So A3 is computed by 1, pi, one times minus 0.5 a1 times 1 and a2 times 1 and you get a sum and then you apply the geo function and that gives you the output as a as a number if it's positive you get x if it's negative you get zero so try to work it out and see if you can get the correct answer you can click on the quiz to see whether you're right so one of some of the issues with large neural networks is that if you take a 256 by 256 RGB image, you have more than 200,000 dimensional input. This is a very large number. So fully connected deep neural networks need large number of parameters with the possibility of overfitting. You're trying to train too hard to fit into the picture itself. Instead, if you try to fit into the images or the features of the picture, uh, that might do a better job. So a generic deep network may not capture the natural invariances we expect in images, location, and scale. So one of the ways to avoid that is to apply your transformation from a group of pixels to a single pixel and, and so on, and then moving that uh, set of pixels to the next window of nine pixels, like here, and then computing the next one there. So that gives you a way to, uh, to capture some of the features that are hidden inside this image itself. So the convolutional network, neural networks are quite uh, popular in terms of image recognition. Like for example, if you're trying to recognize this image, you're not trying to feed the entire thing, but you're really trying to transform uh, small parts of this image through a neural network 
and then finally try to understand that perhaps the uh, the output would be either dog, cat, boat, or bird. That's based on these are the images that we train the uh, neural network with. And in this case, we would expect the boat to be a larger probability because this is likely to be a boat. In other words, this network contains some of the features, hidden features, so the latent features inside this image, which are really uh, uh, sort of uh, reserved, uh, common to a board. So uh, the idea is about sort of uh, making things smaller is something like pooling. For example, if you have a four by four pixels here, 16 pixels, and we can take four by four uh, pixels and then find the max intense insanity of that picture. Like for example, this is six, eight, three, four. By doing this, you can cut the uh, size of the image by a fourth by carrying those pictures. Other example of transforming pictures is filtering pictures. For example, if you have a picture uh, which has these pixels, if you take a portion of the image and you look at the pixel values, and then you can apply a filter to say, we're gonna apply like a zero or no, uh, we'll make, we'll turn that off essentially, and, and so on. So this would, this would give us a way to isolate features and so the filters, sometimes these filters, how do we come up with these filters? They are learned to see what filters works the best. So you could learn the filters that could give you the, the ideas here. So when you apply filters to a real image, you can see what happens to the image. Obviously, you're losing various things and you're reducing some things. Like, for example, here, you're kind of losing the first, the middle in, in the filter if you take a three by three pixel block. And then you're losing this particular lines, the uh, vertical line. And then you're transforming the other ones with negatives and the other one with positive. So by doing that, you can make the images uh, still contain some of the features, but they can be much less. Same way as the pooling we discuss, a two by two pooling is that you take two by two by two windows and find the max number in that. In each one, you find the max number and then you create an image that is one fourth of the original size. Now, there's also recurrent neural networks that are very good at predicting sequential data, such as a text. If you're reading something, you read a certain word, what's the a chance that you will read the next word would be a specific things. So recurrent neural networks are really getting input from the previous state as it goes through the activations and all that. So next let's try to understand the hypothesis cost and optimization in the context of neural networks. So as before with any machine learning, we are trying to come up with a canonical form of our neural, uh, the uh, machine learning problem. So essentially our hypothesis function would be a neural network, which is a nonlinear function, a complex function that we find. The loss function is, can be defined as some level of a logistic log function here which would give you uh, various ways to look at it. Like if you're approximating h theta, uh, y by h theta x, this log function will give you this, certain things. Like for example, if y is exactly the uh, same as h theta x, and the exponent of that would be uh, zero, so it would be zero, that means log of one would be zero, because you have a very large uh, negative number here, if y and h theta x are the same. On the other hand, if y and h theta x are uh, different, so you might have some loss in terms of the value you get here. So the optimization problem is that minimizing this L h theta x with respect to yi. So neural network is a supervised learning method where we feed the data such as, let's say you have a set of pictures and you feed that into the network to learn about this, these pictures. These pictures are labeled and therefore we can find that out. 
So optimization of neural network is based on a variant of the gradient descent method called um, the stochastic gradient descent. We'll talk about that in a little bit. So one of the things that we have to think about is when you train a neural network, you start with some random weights for each of the layers, and then you send the input, given an input, you send it through the neural network and you expect a certain output. And if the output is not what you think, and you have to adjust the output by going backwards. Like for example, if this neuron is supposed to be close to one, but it's not close to one, then what we can do is we can look at all the neurons that contributed to that coming from there, from the previous layer, and increase those weights to build this up. At the same time, decrease the weights of the other neurons because we would like, we do not like this. So we'd like to decrease the weights so that we can back propagate that through the network back to here. So that's the idea of the a neural sort of back propagation idea. So the basic idea of stochastic uh, gradient descent tool will what a gradient descent is. Our minimization objective in machine learning problem is to take the loss function or the average loss over m samples and minimize it. If you assume a, sim assume, assume a simple model like h of x equals theta 0 plus theta 1 x, we find the partial derivatives of the loss function with respect to theta naught, let's say theta naught prime, and theta 1 uh, partial derivative, that's theta 1 prime. So the gradient descent we find by saying theta naught is going to be the previous theta naught times minus alpha times theta naught prime. This is our gradient descent formula that we work with. So just to get an intuition, we can think like this. Suppose the expected value of y, point, point 0.2, but our hypothesis gave 0.15. So therefore, the loss is 0 0.05. So what we can do is we can increase the theta 1 in the h of x by adjusting the weights. Theta 1 is the weight, or theta 0 is the weight. So in order to increase that, we can't work with the bias here. So we can adjust this weight here to get a little closer to the expected value 0.2. If not, we decrease theta 1 to get closer to the expected value of 0.2. So either you increase or decrease to try to get to the expected value 0.2. So that's the idea of back propagation. So we just go back and adjust the weights according to some ratio to get closer. So the idea of a neural network setting is that for a given input 101, we expect, say, the first output neuron for this one to be close to 1, and the others to be close to 0. So that's for a specific input like this with three things. We need to reduce the weight components for others and increase the weight components of the first output neuron. So for example, if you take the first output neuron, uh, that the weight of that output is coming from these weights. So we need to increase those weights, but we need to decrease these weights. And then in order to increase those things, so we find out which one affected this uh, and, and go back and either increase or decrease and keep going backward until you get a better adjustment for that particular thing. So one of the key challenges in neural network is that large number of samples implies that calculating many gradients computationally intensive because you have many thetas. Now, if you think about the simple model in linear regression, we had h theta x equals theta naught plus theta one x. But now we have a lot of thetas because all the thetas are part of a matrix now. So the traditional gradient descent is sum of all the samples. It's computed by computing the next theta by taking the previous theta and multiplying by an alpha, the learning rate, and the derivative with respect to theta for all the examples of the loss function here. So we get something like this. And the alternative approach is to a method called stochastic gradient descent. So what we do is we adjust the parameters based on just one sample at a time, not all of them at a time. 
So I just take one sample and do it for all m samples randomly sorted. So this is the idea of stochastic gradient descent. So this way we don't have to compute a big sum here in order to get there. So gradient descent versus stochastic gradient descent. Updating parameters are based on all the samples, which is expensive for stochastic uh, the gradient descent. This is the typical gradient descent algorithm. But in stochastic gradient descent, we repeat uh, using one sample at a time, x i, y i, as we go. So finally, we will talk about deep learning and data science and the role of data science and in the deep learning uh, perspective. So uh, the basically, there are still many problems that cannot be solved by deep learning. So there's probably 50% of the problems are solvable using a very simple machine learning model like linear regression. And there are many problems that are unsolvable, perhaps, at the moment. And the problems that need deep learning are probably about 5% of the problems that you want to apply to. So deep learning is not the solutions to every problem that you have. So what are the guidelines for using deep learning in data science? When you come up against some machine learning problem with traditional features, for example, human interpretable characteristics of the data, do not try to solve it by applying deep learning methods first. For example, predicting housing prices using characteristics of housing, which is very important or easy for humans to interpret. So let's go with a simple linear or logistic regression model to do so. So you must use the linear regression or classification with nonlinear features or linear features or some level of gradient boosting methods to solve that. If these things still don't solve your problem and you can visualize the data in a way that lets you solve it manually, or if you are really want to squeeze out maybe 1% to 2% of improvements in performance, you can apply deep learning for the last mile, for example. So good applications to use deep learning include forms of data such as text, images, and audio. And deep learning has made significant progress in these areas. For this data, we can take a long time to train a good network. But the rewards can be high once we have a good network trained on data. For example, speech recognition or video segmentation or transcript, fun transcript punctuation, uh, these models can work quite well. So the goal is that the deep learning takes data from high dimension to lower dimensions, and that's important. So resources for deep, deep learning include something like PyTorch. It's a rich ecosystem of tools and libraries that extends the PyTorch and support the development in computer vision and NLP and more. 